gentlemen. Welcome to Lake Havasu Unified School District Governing Board meeting for August 23rd, 2018. If you will join me in a moment of silent prayer and our reflection. You'll stand and join in the pledge. <coughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We went out of order, but Terry, if you call the roll, please. Captain Cox? Here. Pat Rooney? Here. Nicole Cohen? Here. John Mastis? Here. We have called call to the public. We'll start with Mr. Hal Christensen. Thank you. Mr. President. The microphone, please. Mr. President, members of the board, Superintendent Assire, members of the staff, my name is Hal Christensen. What I want to talk about is every year on September 11th, there's a rededication ceremony down at London Bridge Beach that I've attended almost every year that they've had it. A couple years ago, I reached out to Superintendent Assire. I thought it would be good to have some of our elementary school children attend the ceremony, especially since none of them were even born when September 11th occurred. Uh, last year, I talked to the committee chair, and they had a start time of 8.30. The school buses cannot be turned around in time for 8.30 getting the students to, to school, but they could at 9 o'clock. So I asked the committee last year if they could change the start time to 9 o'clock. I was told no, because of the temperature. Now, some of you may know my daughter, Erin Epler, years ago. She had a fourth grade class that she took down there. Our Kiwanis Club was hosting them for lunch. And it just happened that September 11th was on the same day. So the start time of 10 o'clock, Erin took the class down there. She spent some time in the classroom explaining what September 11th was all about. So last year, they wouldn't change the start time. This year, I approached them again. I heard on the radio, the start time is 8.30 again. Uh, I reached out to Gary Parsons, who was the committee chair. And I reached out to a couple of the Marine Corps League uh, co-sponsors. And one of them uh, has tried to get the start time changed. And they won't change it. The same, again, as the weather. Now, with one year exception, I've been there every single year. One time I saw someone have to sit down. Someone else told me they saw someone who fell down and they had an ambulance take them away. Now, for anybody here who has attended this ceremony, there's usually, I'd say, probably 200 to 250 people there. Now, having fifth graders from the six elementary schools attend that, to me, is would be critically important because it, it's part of our history. And, and I think if you do this every year, it'd be, it's important to me and, and people I've talked to, teachers and members of the public, have said they felt the importance too. So it's too late for this year, they've told me, because all of the publications have been gone out. But if anybody here uh, agrees with me and would like to contact Gary Parsons uh, after the meeting or during the meeting, I have his phone number with me and I'd be more than happy to give it to you. Thank you. Next we have uh, Martha Peterson talking on crowdsourcing. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, members of the board. I would like to take this opportunity to highlight some of the positive effects of crowdsourcing. While I understand the concern of the board in regards to crowdsourcing and the message it may or may not be sending to our community, I think it is important to shed some light on how the process is actually working in and for our district. Can you guys hear me? 
As a fifth grade teacher at Starling Elementary School, crowdsourcing, specifically through Donors Choose, has allowed me to purchase materials from my classroom that would otherwise not be available to me. Over the past five years, I've been able to provide my students with Time Magazine subscriptions, classroom sets of novels, several Chromebooks, and science materials that are a wonderful supplement to a 12-year-old textbook that is shared between students and lists Pluto as the ninth planet in our solar system. In the past six years, Starline Elementary has received almost $36,000 in classroom materials and supplies from donors choose. Tax deductible donations have been made by parents, grandparents, spouses of teachers, and teachers themselves, just to name a few. My most recent project was funded largely in part by a parent of a student I had five years ago. Along with these private donors are corporations. Starline has received funding from Orkin, Time, Dick's Sporting Goods, Target, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the Newcomb Family Foundation, AKJ Books, and Wells Fargo. It is my understanding that the discussion moving forward will center on what the district can afford to put in classrooms so that there is equity in the educational process. As a teacher, this concerns me. How can we begin to regulate that? The equity is in the standards that we teach, but there has to be some freedom in the ways that we deliver our instruction. Many of us supplement classroom materials. We either purchase things with our own money or through the generous, voluntary support of donors. We are also really good at sharing. As a parent, I choose to donate to projects proposed by my own children's teachers because I trust that they recognize a need. I do this along with tax credit, even after the passage of our bond and override. I have never felt obligated to do either. It is my choice. I would ask the board to reconsider the benefits of crowdsourcing, specifically through that of donors choose. I believe that most people in our community would agree that the funding of these projects is not only benefit, beneficial to our students, but completely voluntary. It is a way for people to designate tax deductible donations, if they wish, and a way for teachers to provide materials that they may otherwise not have access to. I think it would be very unfortunate if teachers began to feel discouraged from utilizing these types of resources. Thank you. Okay. Superintendent Sire, that's coming back in September. It was not. Actually, I did, the board had not recommended a change, but we can't write it back in September before the discussion. Okay, so we have not changed anything. That's correct. Well, and then my second point on that would be my concern about purchasing okay. curriculum that hasn't come through the board. Right. Uh, item, I, uh, Mr. Harris left, I believe. He yes, had, he had an emergency. He was going to speak on dress code. So he's not here for that, and we'll move forward. Yeah. We can't hear you. Can't hear you. How about now? So good. Okay. Uh, Mr. Harris left <laughs> on an emergency. He will not be able to speak to this topic on the dress code. Uh, so let's move on to. Item number three, which is recognition of visitors. Uh, tonight, uh, Lake Epsom City Education Association, Mrs. Nokowski. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Hi, welcome. I am Carol Nokowski, the Lake Epsom City Education Association President. And I'm just here to speak to our um, President Masson, or directors. The superintendent assigned our community, our staff, and our students. So just to give you an update of the last month from the last time I spoke was we did new teacher orientation. Um, we got to do luncheon and so we got to meet with all of our new teachers and that was really exciting and getting to introduce them into our school and our, to our district. Um, we are really looking forward to all of the new activities that we are about to embrace um, with our school district. Number one, I got to get on the field today. Um, that's it's awesome. And um, then we have Rachel's Challenge coming up. And if you have not heard about Rachel's Challenge, please, please, I urge you on August 27th to be at the Aquatic Center. Um, it is a important and powerful event that uh, we're about ready to change our community in, in every way possible. Um, also, it is the primaries right now, August 28th. If you have not really voted, I encourage you to vote. So that's all I have to say. 
Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Item four is our consent agenda. I'll entertain a motion on that. I'll make a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented. Second. Okay. Pat Rooney? Yes. Kathy Cox? Yes. Nicole Cohen? Yes. John Hansen? Yes. We have nothing under old business, which would be item five, item six. Uh, 6.1 is approval of pay for performance plan for school year 2019. This has to be. President Mastin and Governing Board, it is recommended that the Governing Board approve the following performance pay plan for 2018 19, aka the classroom site fund. The Cavasu Unified School District has high expectations for our students, teachers, and administrators. In that context, the LHUSD performance plan is designed to compensate teachers for attainment of school goals as well as individual performance. This year, the LHUSD District 301 Committee met to review the framework and made no significant revisions. A full copy of the document was forwarded to the board electronically. The members of the board are listed below. As a mandate of the state, this, board, this plan must be approved by the governing board each year. Um, a copy was emailed prior to this meeting. I'll entertain a motion on 6.2. 6.2. Or 6.1, I'm sorry. I'm reading ahead. I make a motion we approve 6.1 as presented. Second. Discussion on 6.1. I have a couple I have a couple questions. So when I was looking through the framework, the actual plan is gonna come back to the board so we're just approving the framework right now yeah you're just approving the framework each of the sites will then approve their plan and that will then come before the board as well okay and then under the professional development um, when it talks about all school site professional development and supportive performance pay will be once per semester after regular contract hours these activities will be a minimum of one hour per semester so Two hours mm -hmm. for the whole year mm -hmm. is what meets that goal? It, in relation to 301, yes. Okay. Any other questions on 6.1? Kathy Cox? Yes. Nicole Cohen? Yes. Pat Rooney? Yes. John Maston? Yes. Item 6.2 is approval to purchase three school buses. Mr. Murray? Mr. President, members of the board, it is recommended that the governing board approve the purchase of three school buses through Canyon State Bus Sales at an amount not to exceed $575,000, and bond funds will be used to make this purchase. Quotes for, uh, from Canyon State Bus Sales uh, are attached to the agenda action item for you to review. There's a 84 passenger route bus, 46 passenger activity bus, and a 38 passenger special needs bus. Uh, the pricing includes all requested options, um, tax and delivery. The quotes were made through the Mojave Educational Co-op and an amount of approval of 575,000 of not to exceeding that amount is requested to cover any incidentals and this item has been reviewed by purchasing. Okay, I'll entertain a motion on 6.2. I make a motion we approve 6.2 as presented. We have a second. Second. Uh, questions? Do we have an answer on the route yet? I mean, we were, we, when we talked about it at the work session, I can't remember who it was, whether it was Bobby or Mr. Becker, that talked about. Um, they were they had a waiting list of people who wanted to ride the bus so i didn't know if i've been able to trim that waiting list in half as of right now okay so we, we are working pretty diligent on that obviously this purchase will definitely help you with that for next year okay. so for the people that weren't at the work session our our high school is now offering service to all of the high schoolers on a there's a waiting list right now until we get all the routes worked out, but that was kind of part of the bond um, promises that we made to the community. So I know that our high schoolers are excited about that. And I understand uh, the football team took the newest activity bus to uh, their game on last Friday. Yep. 
and I heard that you had to turn the air conditioning down because <laughs> <laughs> it was too cold in the bus. Ooh. What a so, to have. so we are getting some pretty significant improvements in our air conditioning nice. in our buses. Yay. So. Any other questions? Cohen? Yes. Kathy Cox? Yes. Pat Rooney? Yes. John Mastin? Yes. Uh, item 6.3 is a discussion of possible action regarding proposed Arizona School Board Association political agenda and delegate assembly. Uh, take that. Thank you, Mr. Mastin. Um, the Arizona School Boards Association uh, does provide uh, an opportunity for boards to select a delegate to vote on their political agenda for the 19, uh, uh, not fiscal, uh, actual calendar year of the political action committee. I'm going to spit it out, so I'm summarizing here. Um, and there are some uh, suggested areas that the ASBA is going to be some stances that they take in certain categories. The board did act to send some suggestions on areas of focus for ASBA, and uh, this is an opportunity now to decide if you want to support their proposed agenda and whether you want to identify a delegate to vote at the assembly in um, September. I make a motion that we approve our president, John Mazden, to act as the delegate for the Cavasi and Fry to vote on this political agenda. Second. Discussion? Question. Do we have to vote on the whole agenda? I don't believe that you do. It's I think individual. You can have the discussion and direct the president on which <coughs> items as a board okay. that you wish for him to support. So are we going to discuss that right now? We well, we would have to. Yes. The only item which we had discussed a little bit at the school board meeting was a recommendation to in increase the compulsory attendance age from 16 to 18 years. And that, on, on the face of it, sounds like a really good idea because it keeps kids in school until they're 18. The problem, there's several problems. When a student wants to drop out of school and he's told he has to stay in, um, it, it, um, he doesn't want to be there and it creates other problems. But we brought that up last week. Uh, I started thinking about that and I realized that it's another issue. What would the, if that were to pass by the legislature, what would the enforcement be? How would we enforce that? Would, even if there is a truancy law, uh, that the legislature has passed, would we really want to send a, a student to, to jail or his parents to jail or to find them? I think we would be reluctant to do that. Um, perhaps not. But uh, the, I don't see that the enforcement would be realistic. And I don't know of another way to do that. So I think that might be something that you might bring up. I myself am opposed to that. I'm, I'm not in favor of it. In fact, we had a board member uh, who left midterm not too long ago that uh, actually did drop out of high school and uh, went into the Marines, wound up getting his general equivalency degree, and uh, uh, came out all right through the process. So I, I think that there are alternate paths out there still, even if it's not the Marines. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I, I, I think you get a point in the development of a, of a young person where, male or female, where they just don't want to be in the institution. Uh, and, and so cutting them off and not allowing them to pursue what they think is the right course for them or their family may think it's not the right course for them. I, I think that does a disservice to, to the overall makeup of the person. And then when they leave on rather good terms, it was their choice to do it, Sometimes they actually come back mm -hmm. after being out in the real world for a while. We would want to always encourage that. I, I have a young man that I'm slowly showing the real world right now at 17. <coughs> okay. 
So there's a lot of them. There are. Would it be helpful if I just went through them and? What, uh, let me ask you, what is our, uh, what, what's our dropout rate? We can't hear you. What's oh, our, can you turn the volume up on the oh. Well, What's our dropout rate? Do you know, we I have that? We, I don't have it right in front of me. We just looked that up. The dropout rate is three percent, which is enviable. But I do want to point out, you can no longer go into the military without a high school. I, I I understand. I I worked my way around that. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. I I guess what I'm saying is, at least in our school district, uh, with that within. A uh, three percent dropout rate—that's very enviable if you compare it to a lot of districts. And uh, so this doesn't appear to be a real problem in our district. And uh, and I do want to echo, as a former administrator at the high school level, just what Kathy said. Uh, oftentimes, you know, they'll get to a point where they want to drop out, or they'll prevail on their parents to pull them out, and just keeping them there creates a whole new set of problems. If you were in an ideal world, uh, you could talk and reason and do all those things. But sometimes that's not the case. And sometimes what they need to do is find out that, uh, like, if they think they're going to take an easy way out, I'll just go into the military. That isn't available today. That's right. They want high school, a minimum of high school graduates. So in some cases, while I was there, Kids would go ahead and make this uh, uh, choice, but they'd reappear and they uh, would come back to school with an entirely different approach as far as graduating. And so, uh, you know, if being an ideal world, uh, I, I hate to see a kid not get his education, but the fact of the matter is, oftentimes what happens is they're going to push the envelope, and that's either they're going to, through their actions and behavior, uh, they're going to force an administrator to take them in front of a school board or they're going to prevail upon their parents to withdraw them from school. And uh, so, you know, I, I think uh, I like uh, it, it right now because kids, can, uh, they get to 16, they say, look, I, uh, uh, no one's forcing me to be here. I'm here and I'm taking this thing seriously. And I think with our students, that's probably, uh, with this 3%, uh, that they probably have that message, get that message. So that's my two cents. That's, that's a few. Right. So um, just for the information of the board and the public, the ASBA has identified four major areas for focus. The first one is adequately and equitably funding district schools to at least the national median per pupil funding. Uh, under that category, they've identified several areas to focus on. The first one is provide additional state funding for nationally competitive salaries to attract, recruit, and retain talented teachers and staff. The second one is to revise the school finance formula to provide a stable, dedicated revenue source, less reliant on the general fund or annual legislative appropriation, and to ensure the formula addresses the unique financial needs of the schools serving students in poverty and in rural schools. The next area is to fully fund full-day kindergarten and include kindergarten students in the override calculations. Next, advocate to preserve and protect the voters' original intent of Prop 301. Provide adequate ongoing resources to ensure district equipment and facilities are maintained and comply with at least minimum school facility standards. Accelerate full restoration of district additional assistance funding. Provide new school construction funding for site acquisition, design, and construction before existing schools exceed their maximum capacity and become overcrowded. Eliminate unfunded mandates and administrative burdens. Return desegregation funding to a primary tax levy. Conduct an, an exceptional student services cost study to provide greater equity in funding and access for exceptional student services within the public school system. Adequately fund the cost of student transportation. Provide funding for preschool programs. 
reform current year funding to a system that provides districts with appropriate, stable annual budgeting ability and technical reliability. Prorate funding over the entire school year among all schools that a student has attended during the year for any student that changes enrollment during the year but has not moved. Improve school safety. So those are all of the items under adequately and equitably funding district schools. There, there are only a couple that I would even start to question in that. Um, one is advocate to preserve and protect the voters' original intent. Um, with the legislative extension, 301 has become more fungible. In other words, the money can be moved around within 301. And one of the things in there, I, I believe, is a $65 million uh, chunk of money that went to go pay bond debt uh, for the school facilities board because they ramped up the school facilities board with, with part of 301 and they bonded against uh, proceeds in order to get that accomplished. Um, that put $65 million available for the classroom site club. I think if we went back to the voters' original intent on 301, and that being a part of the original legislation that was passed, we're now saying that we can't put the $65 million in the classroom site fund. And that, to me, causes a little bit of concern. So that, that's the first one. The second one is, and, and I just want to make a comment about it, because I think we all can agree that we need to take a deep look at how our state funds education, because we've made some pretty woeful mistakes. Um, the formula needs to be readdressed. The waypoints in the formula are out of date. It hasn't kept pace the way it should. Um, and then providing a stable, dedicated source of revenue, I think we can agree with that. I think when we get into the details of that is where we go astray uh, in our thought processes. Uh, I think um, that overall as a thought process it's good, but I, but I think the devil in that first goal uh, in that legislative agenda, the devil is going to be in the details in that. And so, well, I don't see a problem voting for it. I'd really like to see more of what we're actually supporting on that. Well, I'd like to see more of what we're supporting on each of them because they're all very vague. I mean, with the exception of conduct an exceptional study or student services cost study to provide greater equity in funding, I mean, that's a cost study. At least that's something they're going to do, a cost study. But the rest of it, I don't even know what they're thinking, to be honest. I mean, it sounds good. It's a great one-liner. It's a great sound bite, but, you know, they don't even address the funding issue, provide a stable, dedicated revenue source, but they don't even give an example. So, I, you know, I don't trust them, so... I guess that's my issue. I understand. <laughs> <laughs> They've got way too many um, <clears throat> items on here, and they don't, they're not very diligent in providing the solutions that they're going to go after, so how are we supposed to support it? That's my concern. I, I, I think as a broad brushstroke, I can support it, but I, I would agree with you on some of these things, at least on some of them. I think we need better detail to know what they're doing. I think I can go 100% support the United The next section is to preserve and strengthen local control. The categories here are maximize local control and flexibility in managing funds and programs, maintain board control of all secondary property tax levies for district schools, change override budget increase language to better reflect what voters are being asked to support, allow school districts greater flexibility in the, in the divestiture or use of taxpayer fund, funded assets, preserve elected governing boards as the final authority in selecting qualified vendors to provide products or services to school districts, allow districts the option to operate individual schools for 200 day years and increase accompanying funding, oppose legislative intrusion on school site budgeting decisions, maintain exclusive local authority over any measure that would propose to consolidate and or unify any number of school districts into a larger school district. <coughs> Uh, 
Any thoughts on those? The only one I really am concerned about, I, that's my, this is my favorite o overarching one of all of them, but change override and budget increase language to better reflect what voters are being asked to support. Um, I remember there was talk, I don't know if it was last legislative session, um, about combining, uh, I'm, anybody can help me out here if they remember the discussions, but it would have really looked bad for us on a ballot and it would have been untrue and I need to think for a moment on what that is. Do you know Are what I'm referring to the increase in the taxation even though you're not necessarily when you're getting it renewed, how that no, when you're going out for a bond and an override or an override, what was it that you needed to include in your ballot language? Um, not three, not all of the funding sources, federal grants, fe all your funding sources you needed to include, which really uh, ballooned and would make your community question why you're asking for this money. Without the ability to explain that those exactly. are restricted and not able to be spent on the items that would be right. funded right. through the OMA. Right. So that's a concern for me because I, if I'm not mistaken, ASBA was advocating on behalf of that language. So. The one I'm happy to see is, is the exclusive local authority one, the very last one. Uh, one of our legislative district five reps uh, last legislative session was advocating for the roll up of pretty much every district in Mojave County to one master district and counting how much administrative pay and, and so on you would say we're doing that. The problem with it is that you took you would take the decisions out of a locally elected board from the city and you would put it under county level control. And uh, in fact, if I remember the thread, they were pointing out who made what in the administrative branches of, of each city. Um, so I'm happy to see that as, as one of the measures because it's our tax money. It's Lake Havasu's tax money. And we should have, whether we 100% whether we always agree with each other or not, we should have the ability to decide where our tax money goes through our representatives. Improve outcomes for all students is the next category, and you already discussed increase the compulsory increase the compulsory attendance age from 16 to 18 years. The next item is enact research-based reform of the English language learner model of instruction to improve student achievement that does not segregate English lear language learners from English-speaking peers, integrates reading, writing, and oral language instruction, and incorporates multiple assessment majors to demonstrate English. Fully restore ninth grade CTE JTED eligibility and funding to allow students to explore career fields and or certification completion. Allow JTEDs to serve students through age 21 regardless of graduation status. Support policy that recognizes and respects teaching as a profession. <coughs> Testing and accountability measures should be used only to drive instructional improvement. Support policy that protects school district employees and students from discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity. And those are the ones under that category. I don't like the 21 years old for the JTEC. I think that's a huge, huge problem in that one. English language learner. Uh, change in that model. Is, is that going to more of an immersion, do you think? Or? Well, the, the thing about that is I, I would like that to improve and, and include a statement about local control because you have to look at every student individually and to say that uh, a student who speaks no English, understands no English, can read no English, um, that particular student might do well in an immersion <coughs> program with other students, but he might not. But without the, the latitude for the school to make the best decision for the student, I think uh, it's always good to come back to uh, local control. I, I don't disagree with that. And, and I would tell you, I've, I've got a special needs daughter uh, <laughs> who's starting to be mainstream into uh, uh, some regular classes, which is kind of cool cool to see. 
Um, but the reason why is because she's now hit a point in her development where it's appropriate to start this in certain subjects. Um, I can also go back in, in my history, and we had a young man in our house who we were foster parents, who was five years old, who was, was problematic, and I can remember going to the kindergarten classroom and, and the poor teacher, I mean, it was bad enough that, that this young man had, had some behavioral issues that were causing her a hard time. But she had a couple of English language learners in the class in kindergarten. And chaos. I mean, they were just all over the place. So I, I, can, I can see a very good argument for local control. I think you're right. And there is one line in there that says they advocate allowing flexibility. Okay. So that may be the. <coughs> um, yeah, I, I, um, I have a problem with the last one. Support policy that protects school district employees and students from discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity. I think that's covered. I think we've got every law under the sun that already covers that. I don't understand why this is being brought back up again. And really, it's it's based on whatever the law is, not right. us. It's, not it's the, the EEOC the, that covers that, not, that the, not the board. We found that out recently. Yeah. I mean, it's almost useless to have this. <clears throat> The final category is require public accountability for taxpayer dollars spent on education. First item is establish financial and academic transparency for all institutions that accept public funds. Second item, repeal any program that gives public funds for private schools, vouchers, also known as empowerment scholarship accounts, and private school subsidies, student tuition organizations, and prevent any future expansion. Require comparative classroom spending audits for school districts and all other institutions that accept public funds and define classroom spending as both instructional spending and student support spending. And finally, require consistency in the recusal of a board member from a decision in which the member of the, the member or the member's employer stands to benefit financially. I don't disagree with any of those. I, quick comment on the second one, uh, the repeal of any program that gives public funds for private schools. It's, it's kind of a double-sided argument. Uh, to remove funding from the public education system based on enrollment versus the public education system. I don't think there's anybody here that wants to necessarily remove choice from anybody in that, but it, it, it does make it much more difficult to plan and, and run a district if all of a sudden you've got all of these students running here and not. It may not be so much of an issue for Lake Havasu based on the way our, our cities make up their and, and educational opportunities, but you know, you want kids to have a choice, but you don't want to, you don't want to leave one of the choices drawing the process. So that that's what makes it tough. I think ESA is as written is not a good, well written form of doing it. I think you have notes on I do. the board's comments and we will register Mr. Mountain uh, for the delegate assembly. Do we need to vote that there? We need to call that? Um, you are already the call was for John Mastin. Okay. The delegate. All right. I'm, I'm sorry, did we actually oh, vote on the Pat Rooney? Yes. Debbie Cox? Yes. My Bible will say that I think John will represent the board very well. He'll do a good job. Nicole Cohen? Yes. John Nassman? Yes. Item 6.4 is first presentation review of revised policies. Thank you, Mr. Mazden, Mazden, members of the board. We have a list of policies that uh, cover several pages. Um, these are policies that have technical reviews uh, 
uh, revisions, excuse me, based on changes in legislation in the law. Um, we do have one policy in which the district has also inserted an additional definition, and that is per recess. Otherwise, these are the ASBA suggestions. The first few are in relation to the new budget law and the requirements there. Um, then there are some additional ones that um, provide some minor changes of language. Okay, I'll entertain a motion on 6.4. Make a motion we approve 6.4. Second. Discussion on 6.4. Couple questions. Yes. Uh, so the first policy, um, DICA, the budget format, when will that be on our, when will we actually have that up on the front page of our website? We are, um, we've already met uh, internally to, to address these uh, six areas. After the second presentation, we will be ready to go live. Okay. So we have to wait for the second presentation in order for that to happen. Okay. And then on page 20, under the student wellness, JLRA, under nutrition education. Um, so I'm assuming this is our current policy because it's not underlined. And, okay, so it's saying that we shall include, but not limited to the following essential components, age appropriate nutri nutritional knowledge and the list goes on and on but it also includes and cultural diversity related to food and eating. Why do we have cultural diversity under our nutritional um, guidelines for nutrition? Is that potentially a federal requirement? I have no idea. And then that was A. <laughs> and then C, it says consistent nutrition messages are disseminated from the district throughout the schools communities, home, and media. Are they talking about distributed from us? Because we can't coordinate a consistent nutritional message. We, have, we do distribute the menus and information on the okay. menus and things like that. So they're that. talking, it's we mean our accessible. media. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then, I, I would just like to see D gone. Nutrition education is extended beyond the school environment by engaging and involving families and communities. I mean, I think that's just, we have what we have in our schools, but in my opinion, we're not even doing the right things by our kids when it comes to nutrition in our schools, but I understand that's a whole other meeting, I'm sure, maybe a week-long conference, but to me, that seems like an overreach. <clears throat> in looking at the back of the page, it doesn't look like there is a requirement in the statute. So, because there's no statute listed as reference, so I believe that at the board's discretion, we can add or remove language on this policy without being out of line with the law. I'd, I'd like to see if we can. Let's let's push it off to to later on on Nicole's questions and we can we do these things. And let me ask Mrs. Walter, are we already doing D or is that not the nutrition education extended? We we do community programs. We have our extended summer program that goes out to the community and it's a free lunch program that we do allow people to participate in that. So there is a community outreach and we look at those programs. It's not just limited to our students during the school day. That summer program is extended community based. So that would but it's really not an education, would it? It's not an education no, program. No, just but as far yeah. as just yeah. information right. on the nutrition program, there's literature usually available regarding their program, those kinds of things. Um, we used to have a nutrition grant, but I don't believe we can currently have that, so it's no longer in place. There's a, a district wellness committee that will meet uh, probably around December, January-ish of this year, and we can have them review this policy as well during that time, as well as uh, allow legal to take a look at it. And then my last question was <clears throat> under the, well, it's on the top of 22. Only food prepared or obtained by the district's food services programs can be served. On our in should our campuses, be, should be served. 
Should. It says should. Should be served. Should be served. Okay. Well, is that a, is that prohibiting anything um, else? It, typically, uh, we don't allow homemade items to be brought into the. Well, lunch. and I understand. Yes. So I know they, that. if it's not prepared by our child nutrition services, it would be purchased from them. Okay. So this isn't precluding any pizza being ordered. Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. Well, it is. We are not allowed. We have to. We're told we can't do anything without the permission of our cafeteria during the school day. Right. right. So, school day. so we can't bring anything into a school out of any commercial kitchen outside of Lake Abyssinia Unified during the school day. If we pre-notify the cafeteria that they won't be having lunch, and we can't have it in the cafeteria with their lunch. That's correct. And the reason behind that is so that they can make sure that their food preparation counts are somewhat uh, in line, so they're not they're not preparing for 300 kids. Right. And then so yeah. it's half the half the classes are having pizza so, parties that day. But so we're restricted not, to eat it in our classroom. So so it's not you can't. It's you have to have proper notification. Right. And in your classroom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this says right. includes classroom reward or incentive programs involving food food items as well as food and beverages offered or sold at school-sponsored events. Yeah. And so that would be so. Sort of, um, for example, you can't daily be bringing in food from elsewhere because then you're not following the nutrition guidelines. So on occasions, um, they can do that, but they, it wouldn't be like you could say, uh, this class is going to have this food brought in from in and out every day of the week because that food wouldn't meet the nutrition guidelines. And is there a clause in our contract with, help me pronounce, Taha? Taha. Taha, thank you. Taha? Taha. Taha. Ta is there a clause in the contract? <coughs> it seems. It's, it's more to be in line with uh, just state and federal policy and, okay. and regulations. It's not a, it's not a Taha requirement. It's to align ourselves with state and federal law. Any other questions on 6.4? Carrie, now I'll ask Carrie to call the vote. Kathy Cox. Were you going to go over JL and JLZ? Well, we're just doing the questions on the policy. Okay. We've got the motion on the entire package. Okay. Okay. Yes. Nicole Collins? Yes. Carrie Collins? No. Rooney? Yes. John Baston? Yes. And just just for clarification, the change on JLRV was to was to define reasons, uh, which is a period of time during the regular school day, including time before or after scheduled lunch period, during which a pupil is able to engage in physical activity or social interaction with other pupils. Okay, so recess. And that is the definition out of the statute. Um, item 6.5 is adoption of policy exhibit A, B, D, district philosophy, doctrines, and definitions. Uh, Superintendent Sider. Yes, thank you. Right. President, members of the board, it is recommended that the governing board adopt a new policy exhibit A, B, dash E, district philosophy, doctrines, definition. Um, this will be added to the district policy manual as a backup to policy AD, which are our guiding principles. Um, we had discussed at the time that we developed the mission after the work of our curriculum committee that there were various interpretations of the language in our mission statement. And so uh, the board had a special session, a work session, to go through and look at the definitions of those words. So the backup documentation uh, identifies words in the mission statement that would then be defined uh, for a person who chooses to click on that word and seek further clarification on the definition. Uh, I do have the, the uh, I believe, the uh, direction from the board from our work session that we should remove the word doctrines from this. So for second reading, that would uh, be removed. And then there was going to be further discussion this evening about the actual content of definitions. I will entertain a motion on 6.5. I make a motion we approve 6.5 as presented. Second. 
because discussion on 6.5. Um, on the word doctrines, uh, can we simply call it the district mission statement instead of uh, uh, get rid of both the word philosophy and doctrines? The, um, I've been in the, uh, uh, involved with the school district since the 1970s, and a doctrine is something that usually lasts a really long time, like the church doctrine or the Monroe doctrine. And every time that we get a new superintendent and or a school board, they come up with a new mission statement. So this is not going to last for 100 years or 50 years or 10 years. Um, ask, ask Carrie how many times she's had to work on a new mission statement. And so I just don't think philosophy, doctrine, just that's what we set out to do is to write a, dis a, missions, a mission statement. Um, so that is my first. step by step up to you to respond to that. And, and let me also add, I said pretty much everything that I wanted to say at the last school board meeting, and I don't have any desire to bog down this particular meeting. Um, so um, um, having said that, I'm going to propose something that's, you know, I think is just be really simple. And, um, but I'm going to begin with the philosophy doctrines definition. So, it's your turn. Well, I think that the idea of changing the uh, mission statement was because uh, we wanted something maybe that was more lasting, that wasn't, you know, kind of trendy, wasn't really the speak of, you know, what's happening in the education world this year or in this five-year period, but something that would be more enduring. So, I mean, that's how we came up with our mission statement as a board, to focus on scholarship, character, and humanity. And um, because we knew that that was gonna um, uh, guide the curriculum decisions that we made as we were looking to purchase more curriculum. So, it's unfortunate that you think that it'll be, you know, gone, my hope would be that we would focus on something instead of constantly changing. Um, I think that's part of the problem in education is that we're constantly changing what we're doing and so you never really get to um, focus and become really um, good in any area because you're constantly jumping. It's a, it's I don't a know point. how else to put it. It's the nature, it's just the but it doesn't have to be. That's no. that was the point. It, that could, it could last for 25 years. I, I just in my experience doesn't isn't necessarily binding into the future. Just in my experience that that's what happens. So sure. Um, now it, now this particular mission statement is. Um, I looked up mission statements. How long should they be? And it says two to four sentences and 50 to 100 words. And I think. The mission segment itself is is fine, and um, I thought it a good idea to define some of the words in the mission statement. Um, so and that's what we were able to do, especially since we can have provide links on the website. The um, the problem that I had, or the concern that I had, um, would be um, what once we came up with definitions, then we started giving definitions of words in the definitions. And this, it makes this very long, um, and um, that's, that, that's an issue that I have, is just how very long, long it is, and giving definitions inside the definitions is not a good idea. Well, well, it was just a suggestion, uh -huh. and we were all right. encouraged to provide suggestions. So, I, I believe I have I have a kind of an overview of the solution. Okay. okay. First and foremost, the entire mission statement is is not contained in the blurb on the back. That is the shortened mission statement. There is much more that goes into the formation and creation of a mission statement 
than the single sentence. So I, I think it's a very good exercise to let those that are doing business with you, not the people that are studying in our district, right. not our students, but the people who would go past our website or who would inquire, what does our district do? What do we stand for? Where are we at in the world? We need to kind of give them an idea of, of where we're at. Okay. The next problem that we have is we are assuming that everybody who is going to go past that has a reasonable understanding of what is meant by certain words. And I can tell you that when we throw certain words out, that it's up to the context and the point of view and the worldview of the individual as to what certain words mean. For instance, doctrine for you means something entirely different than what doctrine means for me. Uh, so as we get into words and the meanings of words and, and the minutia of it, I, I think it's, it's important to, to find a level where we're all comfortable defining things. Now, one of the areas that you were really kind of, I don't know, um, uh, concerned about was when we got to like, like the right to life, liberty, property, and the pursuit of happiness. Mm -hmm. um, I can tell you why I like that. And if we go back to someone like, say, John Locke, if you go to the second treatise on government and you go into chapter five, there's a really great example that he gives. Okay, and, and we I remember this happened back in, in the in the late 1600s. And so as, as Locke gives the example, he's walking down a path in a forest, and he comes upon an apple tree. And in, in the natural back then, the apple tree would have been owned by the creator. But for our purposes here, the apple tree is an unneeded, unowned land by any entity, foreign or domestic. And you reach up, and you grab the apple. And you take the apple off the tree. And the question becomes at that point, who owns that apple? Well, you do, is the way Locke would have answered that, because your labor harvested the apple, therefore it is your apple. And as we harvest more apples and we get more apples than we can consume, then we get into trade and, and barter and currency and all sorts of things. So when I look at the word property, I look at the word property meaning the fruits of my labor, whether it's my intellectual labor or my physical labor, and my right to pursue that property based on that definition. So when I look at the right to life, liberty, property, and the pursuit of happiness, I look at that word property and I see that it's very, very important, and there are very good reasons why they left, left that out, and went to Locke's later one, I think it was in 1698, where he came up with the pursuit of happiness which is a much broader, more encompassing term. The reason why it was left out of the Declaration of Independence and the kind of life, liberty, and property was simply because of the issue with slavery and disagreement, even at those times between the North and South, on, on what, what would happen if we included the word property, even the Declaration. We also got into definitions. And okay. Can, can we? I don't, want, I don't want to interrupt you. No, no, go ahead. Right job. I just, I just want to clarify my objection to. It says, "quote life, liberty, property, and the pursuit of mm -hmm. happiness." Seems to indicate that that's actually a quotation from a document. Well, and, and property's and not in the Declaration of Independence. But it's in, it's in the founding it's in the founders' thought processes because that was the quote from Locke. So we can either take the quote from Locke <coughs> and then move the pursuit of happiness into a separate bracketed quote, or we can move property into a separate bracketed quote. But, but both, I think, are important to have in there because there is a clarification that pursuit of happiness actually encompasses property. Well, let me clarify something there, okay? The, the, de the Declaration is not a legal document. It's a declaration. The Constitution well, let's go there. is a, a legal let's document, go there. okay? Okay, because, because the other assertion that we had in, in the work session was that there was no right to property. In other words, there is no right to the, to, to the fruit of your labor. Right to property mentioned in the Constitution. It's, it's all through it, though. It's, it's actually all through it. And forgive me for using notes because it's in there a lot of times. 
Um, let's see. Accordingly, we require that direct taxes, most importantly property and income taxes, be apportioned among the states. Taxes come from property. They do. That's in Article 1, Section 2, Clause 3, and Article 1, Section 9, Clause 4. They also require that indirect taxes, such as import duties, be leveled uniformly, which is in 181 and 196. They flatly deny Congress power to tax exports in 195. Right there, in that one little example, is the start of where the Constitution starts to deal with property. They empowered Congress to protect intellectual property and authorized copyright and patent laws in 188. They, they, they granted Congress the authority to punish piracy. Okay. That's 1810. Okay. They denied Congress and the state's authority to pass ex, ex post facto laws. Okay. A ban that some founders thought would protect property. So the concept is there, and after the Constitution well, was ratified, it has been developed. Uh, well, I thought you were a strict constructionalist. Isn't that what you said? Yes, but the uh, right to property as a statement <clears throat> is not in the Constitution the way your uh, right to voice your opinion is. Those kinds of rights. When we, the word right specifies something but, very... But you, but you go back to Locke and you have to understand that, that property and liberty are intertwined. They were so, at that time, so intertwined that this was, this was not even, even a thought to include it in the case document. It goes all the way through it. Well, they even created a currency system, which again governs what we use today to account for the work that we do, the all that we have in our intellectual property. Let it not be said that I am against property. <laughs> but, I like my property. So but, I'm protecting but, it. But I no, just put clarification but, but I, for students. This isn't for students. This is for the public. Well, for the, for the public, for everybody, and for students but, as well. I, can, I, can, I, can I put one more point in there sure. before we before move ahead. forward? The other thing that I that I think you don't understand is is when we get into inalienable rights and, and self-defense is an inalienable right. That's why we have the Second Amendment or freedom of speech is an inalienable right. It's protected. Why are if we if we start talking about negative rights and negative rights are rights that the state may not touch. When we start talking about negative rights, why wouldn't property be a negative right? And why in the Constitution? Do the founders so painstakingly go through this article by article and put protections in on something that is not a negative right? Can you explain that to me? Because I believe it is based on what I see in here. Well, John, I, I, the simple thing is you've got quotations, life, liberty, property, and the pursuit of happiness. Take out property, that's one of the, that, that, those words, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness are one of the most important quotations Where? from our history. You have to, it's in quotations, it's from the Declaration. Property's just not in that line. If you, you mentioned a little while ago, you want to take property out and write it in some other way that it is, it, the concept of it or the beginnings of it, the, the right to property is, it, is, it is, it is something, however you want to write it, but it just doesn't go in that phrase. So we could we could move it down another line and say the right to the fruits of your labor. Yes. I, I, I think most good. people would understand, and, and and I agree with Kathy. You can't all of a sudden put in a word in a quote and say that's part of the quote. So it, it's a well-known quote: the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And that pursuit of happiness, most people understand that. In fact, if this is for the public and they read that, I as an adult would know that, hey, uh, this is one of the things that fall underneath that. I'm not, I'm not going to disagree with that at all. And, and, and again, but, but I, you know, that, that would be sort of like a, so, a, an original quote and someone changes it around. I mean, you'd catch all types of heck in the academic circles on TV and everything else. So I, I support Kathy in that if, if, if you're going to go with that quote and have it in quotations, 
It's the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And, and again, when we talked about this at the work session, I didn't disagree with the fact that we should fix it so that the quote is correct. Where I had my disagreement was, was when I was told that there was not a right to property. And that was said at the work session. And, and, and there absolutely is. It, it, it is an irrefutable fact that in our founding that that was a, a, a right and it was something that is interwoven into our Constitution, into our founding documents. And that's understood. I mean, if you follow history, as soon as the, the uh, people got here, even prior to the, the Articles of Confederation or the Con Declaration of Independence or the Constitution, the people owned property. That's why a lot of them were coming to the U.S. and more opportunities, you know, and all the other uh, freedoms that they got. But people had property. So, and I think that the Founding Fathers understood that that pursuit of happiness includes that. It's all encompassing. And, and it includes the issue of property. And, and, and yet, we're here talking about whether or not we should have some reference to, to, to property and property ownership to further explain this to the public that, that we serve. Yeah. Um, the other problem that we got into was on definitions. Yeah. My recommendation, and I brought you a listing from that, is there is a website for Black's Law Dictionary. I believe that if we took each one of the listed ones and we marked them so that they <coughs> went to Black's Law for the definition, as opposed to having our own, I think that should solve that. Yeah, I, I think the discussion was there when you got down to the issue of liberty, and we went beyond uh, uh, the democracy and we start focusing on these other isms. Uh, I did spend some time up at the high school today with both a free enterprise teacher and a civics teacher, and I'm satisfied that those things are being well covered in U.S. history, free enterprise, and civics. In fact, I did look at the Free Enterprise book, and, and they were uh, dealing with a lot of those things. So I don't know why we're, uh, we're uh, with, I'd rather focus on our system, uh, what we're offering the public, rather than explain to the public what Marxism, fascism, anarchy is. They're already getting that. Uh, uh, and I spent... Uh, well, maybe not according to you, but I went, uh, I went ahead and looked through there. And I used to teach all three of those subjects. And the fact of the matter is, if you're, if you're any type of a teacher dealing with any of that stuff, you're going to cover that in a classroom so that when a kid walks out of school, he's aware of those things. But I would rather focus on uh, what we're trying to accomplish as a society and the school is an extension of our society in uh, inculcating kids with the things about our own systems. Well, and, and, uh, and I'll tell you one of the gentlemen I talked to is sitting right up there. And, uh, but Pat, when, when we have a board member that that indicated one of the systems that governs our country is a democratic republic. I start to think that maybe we should have some of those definitions out there. We're not a democratic republic. We are a republic. We're a constitutional republic. Right. That is our form of government. We're a constitutional republic. What curves power of the of the representatives who are elected what curbs the power when they don't cast their vote the way uh, as called the people want them to what happens I mean, if, if, if you if we, you vote them out if, if that's we, what the democracy part is actually no because because again from black's law dictionary uh, a, a republic is a commonwealth form of government which derives all its power directly or indirectly from the general body of citizens, and in which the executive power is lodged in officers chosen by chosen by and representing the people and holding office for a limited period of time. 
and, and, and I can go on, and there are, there are uh, federal paper citations against it. Uh, that's why I want to use Black's Law, because Black's Law makes this black and white. Well, I'll come, I want to come back to Black's Law in just a minute, but I, I want to stay where we are right now. One of the things that concerned me when you listed, uh, you have liberty, freedom, republic, <clears throat> republic, rule by law and representation. Then the next word is democracy, and the connotation there is is uh, is bad. Um, well, it's better than mob rule, which is what, what I okay. had there before. I fixed it. Wait just a minute. Again, this is this is why we're going. I think we should go to Black's Law definition. And, well, and if you look at the Black's Law definition, I mean, you're you're taking this this one apart. I'm proposing alternate definitions, and and what you're doing is you're circling back around the definitions that were laid out in the original item, and you're ignoring the proposal. Well, the word democracy, unfortunately, if you have your TV on, you will hear it a hundred times a day. Unfortunately, people use it as a synonym, uh, whether they're talking about a representative form of government or whether they're talking about people getting to vote. That's the reality. Language changes, words change. And I would never want our students to think that a democracy, uh, democracies can lead to excess, democracies can lead to mob rule. But uh, so far, uh, we were all brought up thinking that democracies were, were good until now, and we have someone who's clarified that for us. So now we know that they're not as good as we used to think. I would not want our students to think the word democracy had a, a, a negative uh, uh, from the school board, that it was something negative. I, I just, I cannot vote for that. Of course, any, any word here can go to an excess to talk about our republic and our representatives talking. Let's talk about our, our representatives in Congress. Let's talk about the uh, revolving door lobbying. Let's talk about uh, people voting for their own self-interest. I think Nicole has mentioned before that we need representatives who vote in the interest of the country. Everything here, including the word republic. I don't know that I ever said that. <laughs> well, you, you, you made a comment about, uh, about uh, our People voting in their own self-interest, absolutely. Bipartisan no. betrayal, well, both if, parties, if you, absolutely. If you vote, if you own a company and you're a representative and you vote, that the, that's the who is it? The head of our state senate owns a charter school and he votes for uh, uh, he votes for charter schools. He should be recusing himself. <laughs> our representatives also, it's, they're not perfect, and and uh, because they're not perfect, we're republic. Democracy is not perfect either, but they're both precious, precious <clears throat> words not to be not to be denied. And it's something I can never do. I will never vote against the word democracy. I will never vote against that. So there's nothing that you can do out on that do, do you, to get my vote. Do you see a, a problem with the way democracy is defined by blacks? form of government in which the sovereign power resides in and is exercised by the whole body of free citizens as distinguished from a monarchy, aristocracy, or oligarchy. According to the theory of a pure democracy, every citizen should participate directly in the business of governing, and of course we're not a pure democracy, and the legislative assembly should comprise the whole people. But the, but the ultimate lodgment of the sovereignty being the distinguishing feature the ultimate lodge, lodgment of the sovereignty being the distinguishing feature. The introduction of the representative system does not remove a government from this type. However, a government of the latter kind is sometimes specifically referred to as a representative democracy or um, a uh, representative, let's see, a democratic uh, republic. Uh, one or the other, they're both used synonymously. Well, I would point you to several examples of, of places that call themselves democratic republics. Uh, Venezuela would be one. Well, just because it calls itself one doesn't mean that it is. The Congo would be another. Well, again, 
cost it costs itself. One. North Korea would be another. The, how about the union of, of, of uh, what is what is uh, North Korea? What does it call itself? A Democratic Republic of North Korea. Well, Everyone knows it's not. Well, and it's it's none of the above. Right? It's well, just I mean, North Korea. It's really okay. the only applicable thing in that entire title. Okay. And, and but 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 <coughs> that's kind of my point to you is is that words mean things, and as we as we use these words and as we put these labels on what we are as a country, and as we use other examples to differentiate ourselves from other forms of government, as we define what it is to be a responsible citizen within our country. These words have absolute meaning at the, back to the public, to where the district is and, and, and what its thought processes are in, in producing the mission statement. I, I, I understand, Pat, that you think it goes too far. Yeah, I, I don't have a problem with the first form okay. at all, even if you want to include these extended definitions. But when all of a sudden we, uh, we, we start focusing on socialism, Marxism, fascism, anarchy, tyrants, tyranny, despot, arbitrary. Uh, I mean, we could go down, that's unlimited. I mean, that you, you could get more specific. I mean, on things like that, those are things that should be taught and discussed in your history, free enterprise, and political science classes. But if we're look, really looking at what we're offering, what we think they ought to do, uh, as far as liberties, that's what the focus ought to be on those first four, rather than on all those others. So, and, and, yeah. and, and I don't mean to minimize that, but I, I just think that all of a sudden you start inserting a lot of things like this. Uh, uh, where, where do you stop? I mean, uh, I, you could put theocracy down there, which sure. would be a description of Iran. You could put communism down there. But you could put Where's all oligarchy? the isms. Where's oligarchy there? Where you could put there? all the isms down there. Sure. That, that's why I say... Well, these are the words that are that are being thrown about on TV every single day. I don't see oligarchy. I hear well, that. Well, I don't hear that thrown about on TV every day. I do. I do. Oh. Well, I don't... I don't hear them. What's that? The Russians. It's constantly in the Russians. No. And... and uh, those are not terms that, are, that, if what I watch on TV, are, come across as favorable by any means. And kids that come out of schools, public schools or private schools or whatever, I mean, any good political science class, any good free enterprise class, a, U, a, a U.S. history class that covers uh, a, a whole year, that should be, uh, and I think you start taking U.S. history your junior year, right? Senior year. General. U.S. U.S. history. Oh, U.S. history. Yeah. Junior year. <laughs> that should be stuff that is included in the class room. So, and you probably even get it a little sooner on some of these isms if you take world history. Is world history required? Yes. Okay. So you're required to take world history. They're going to deal with, and that is a whole year, right? Well, this is a whole year, yeah. Yeah, it's a whole year, and you're going to deal with all those things. They're going to deal with it uh, as far as a world point of view. Then you're going to, the, the next year, you're going to get U.S. history that really focuses on us, us as Americans, our history, and what our beliefs are. And then you round it off as a senior, and you have to take free enterprise and civics to graduate, right? All four of those are required classes to graduate. I don't have a problem with the first four, but I think those other things, other than as a district emphasizing that in a broad statement, it so, should be only the top. So, so ma'am, may I make a suggestion that we withdraw the motion on the floor in the second, and uh, we re-motion this with the floor? <coughs> Yeah. Okay. And, and which definitions do we want to use? Do we want to use no, the, definitions or the ones that. The, the, is this what you want to use? Law. Okay. I, I, just, I just think that's. Well, I think it's. Okay, I think we're also looking to remove property and have rights to the fruits of your labor. Right. But, but let's, if we have an agreement to remove the motion, 
who, who made that motion? Was that going to be I'm sure I did. Yes, you did. I, I'm sure I did, but I, I, I just wanted to read something really short. It was at the very end of an article written by Tom Keister, a forming, former na Navy intelligence specialist. And he wrote, it's little wonder that democracy is the favorite refrain of the socialists. The Socialist Party USA's website uses the word 16 times in its brief statement of principles. It's the nat it is natural that they would promote democracy since the productive are always vastly outnumbered by the moochers. The Communist Manifesto says the revolution should be accomplished by establishing democratic constitutions and that democracy should be, quote, immediately used as a means for putting through measures directed against private property, end quote. Democracy allows the lazy majority to vote itself a portion of what the productive have earned. It is, as someone once described it, two wolves and a sheep voting on what to have for dinner. And so it has gone for America. We have indeed degenerated into a democracy. Socialism is firmly established and has openly won two consecutive presidential elections. The wolves have voted and we are being served for dinner. And I say that because when we had our curriculum meeting and I had a teacher tell me after that meeting that she had students coming up to her saying, what's wrong with socialism? So this is a concern for our country, you know, not just our community or our schools. This is a major concern when you have young people thinking socialism is okay. So, you know, having definitions, this was never intended for the students. This was not to impose on... But what I'm saying, Nicole, is I suppose since you said the, the, the two elections, you're talking about the election prior to this one. Well, right? I'm not saying it. I was just no, reading, no, no, and no, I, I should have stopped because I didn't want this to turn into no, anything presidential, but this is no, prevalent I, everywhere. I know that. But the thing is, what I'm saying is, uh, now you got me off track. You know? <laughs> I didn't mean to get you off track. Never mind. But it's very popular. But let's just say that. But, uh, but in those previous two elections, I would say that uh, you probably didn't have uh, very many people under a certain, the younger voters weren't making that big decision. It was the older, you know, the more mature voters that were doing that. You see what I'm saying? I, I think, it, I'm sorry, I think that's wrong. It was the young voters. Can it I was the young voters point? that overwhelmingly a came out. Please. What does it mean when you say the right to apply for federal employment requiring U.S. citizenship? I just want to say that that was actually, uh, when I wrote this up, I pulled off of the citizenship rights and responsibilities right from whitehouse.gov. So this was, and that is what is listed. So what does that mean? I don't know. This was for discussion purposes for us as a board because there was no other suggestions. But I really just wanted to distinguish between negative rights and positive rights. Which to me, that's a positive right. Is it, is it saying that's right to drop? And I'm sorry, I throw a monkey wrench in it, but no. that's, it, that's no, a glaring difference. That's fine. It is a positive right. You're, absolutely you're, you're right. So are you socialist? <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were So, so. I, my recommendation is we withdraw the motion and, and we remove it, adding the right to the fruits of your labor to the rights list, and we take the first four items under liberty and uh, use the Black's Law definitions on those. Is that, is that agreeable to withdraw the motion? I'm agreeable to withdraw the motion, but I would be really agreeable if, if you would open up the discussion to anybody else who may have attended this meeting for this particular point. I don't know if anybody we, we, else, we but can, there's a lot of people I don't normally see here. We can, we, can, we can absolutely do that. If any of the public would like to comment on the item for us. I don't believe the teacher has a right to tell my child whether or not. I'm if, sorry. Sorry. Mrs. Mrs. Wolf, don't yes. need to step okay. up. And identify yourself sorry. and use the microphone. I'm Mrs. Wolf, um, or Kelly Wolf. I have two daughters at the high school. Um, and I'm a teacher. If, as a high, if I was a high school teacher and a student approached me with the concern of why is socialism not okay, 
I don't believe it's an educator's position to tell them why it's not okay. That's the, what if that's their parents' belief? That would be like if a student came up and said, why is Catholicism not okay? It, if you're cross, if you don't know what beliefs are going on at home, I've had a student who, I can't remember what they were, but they believed in no government. I have to respect that as a student and make sure, so anything we did on um, <coughs> Veterans Day or any of those things, I had to come up with alternative assignments for him because they would not allow him to do anything that dealt with government. So, I mean, we have to respect families who may not practice what we believe. Okay, we're not talking about theology. We're talking about our form of government, and your statement really, really concerns me. Yeah. Because if we're not going to teach our form of government, well, what are we teaching? I'm not saying we shouldn't teach our form of government, but you said it, it concerned you that a teacher said a student came up and said, what's wrong with socialism? What if their parents are socialists? That's their family and their household's choice. So to, if you want to figure out a definite, you know. Correct, and we are not allowed to give our personal Opinions. Folks, she has it for us. So if she's finished, you know, somebody else go to the mic, please. I, I guess maybe I'm misunderstanding as a teacher. We're told we are not allowed to enforce our political beliefs or our religious beliefs into our classroom. So if a student asks why something isn't okay, I can't answer that question. We can teach the generalized of all those things which I believe should happen, but I don't think we should impose our beliefs on them if they have a specific question that needs to be directed at home. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else wish to address the board on this? I'll get up and do it. You need to state your name for the record, please. My name is Sharon Walker. And I believe this is an American country. We have American school books, although they've been per perverted with Common Core to, in perverting the true history of our country. We need to stop it. You want to save our schools and our children? Teach them the old-fashioned way. Teach them the true history, not this baloney of socialism all that stuff. This is an American country. If you want to believe in communism, Marxism, socialism, that's your business. But not in my school. Amen. My name is Luana Gillette, and I just want to say that if you're teaching the Constitution, then you're teaching the children our way of government. And if you're teaching about communism, then you're teaching them what communism is. It doesn't mean that um, you have to say that it's wrong or it's right. Teach them what it is. They'll figure out that it's wrong. But we need to teach them our constitution. We need to teach them our Bill of Rights. We need to teach our children about our government. I get sick. When I see on TV these people that go to colleges and ask these kids, they don't know who the president is, they don't know who the vice president is, they don't know anything about the Bill of Rights, they don't know anything about our Constitution, and they have gone through our school system and gotten all the way to college and they know Jack. Thank you. Right. Hi, my name is Chris. My daughter is just starting her second year of uh, high school. Chris, can you give us your last name, please? May. Thank you. Is this for the public or comment on this? No, it's on what's currently going on. So, back when I was in school, I went to a private school. We were taught Christianity. But we were also given information of other, like Darwinism. Why? Because then when someone came up and engaged us in a conversation, we knew what it was about. Not necessarily that we agreed or disagreed, but we were provided the information. 
so that we could understand where they were coming from and engage in dialogue. Because that's what all this needs to be done is engage in dialogue. Not say, you can have your beliefs, but we also need to give them, this is what it is. Here's the facts. This is, so that they are aware why we have the system that we have of our government. Because our constitution was allowed to be fluid because our forefathers knew there was going to be things they could never project would happen in 200 years. They had to leave flexibility in the Constitution. And why they had the beliefs and everything, because they saw the problems with the other stuff. And if our students don't understand or see the facts of what the other things is, they're not going to want to uphold or understand what our system is or why we have our system. Thank you. Thank you. Can, can I ask a question? Uh, now to graduate from high school, you have to take the, uh, uh, what is it? The citizenship. Citizenship test, which is uh, given out to immigrants that are coming yes. to this country. Is, is that right? Correct. And it's uh, constitutionally based. Okay, and so can you, how many kids failed that last year? Anyone know? Mr. Barney knows. Right around eight. Eight out, of how, eight out of how many? Eight or ten, and at least some of them were English language learners. Okay, but out of how many kids at Cook? Yeah, you had a, a class of over 400. Yes. Okay, so, and, and some of those were <coughs> kids that were English language learners, and, right? And probably one or two uh, children with special needs. Okay, so out of the old, uh, little over 400 graduated, was that how many was in the class last year? And so you have eight fail it, and that's the requirement to graduate from a school in Arizona, right? Correct. And uh, of those, there were a couple of special ed, am I correct? Mm -hmm. And English language learners. Mm -hmm. So evidently, something is getting taught and taught well in the schools. And, and actually, uh, it used to be that in order to graduate from high school, you had to achieve a certain level on the Ames testing, is that correct? And so then what happened is because there was a lot of discussion on that, the legislators, the people who were elected, uh, came up with this idea. Am I correct or am I putting words in someone's mouth? This was in response to the Goldwater Institute. Um, the Goldwater Institute did a study a number of years ago where there, they found there was very low scores. Um, I don't know if I agree with the study, but this was Doug Ducey's response. And yes. so um, they instituted the test. And what they found is when the kids have a, um, uh, because people respond to incentives, so when the kids had an incentive to pass, they passed. Okay, but what I'm saying is so that the politicians, the people that we elect to go to Phoenix, they made this decision that this would be a, uh, either through ADE or something. This was they, Doug Ducey's first Okay, they made this decision yes. that this would be a good indicator that these kids, you know, it wasn't in math, it wasn't in PE, it wasn't in English, but it focused on uh, this, uh, this, uh, this uh, citizenship. citizenship test that is all politically uh, geared. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. That you can pass to the D and take 40 times. Am I correct? Okay, I'm not a politician. <laughs> right, I I'm, know. I'm just, just saying it's not I'm some not meaningful politician. measure in but my mind. But how many mind. kids need multiple times? Eight. Yeah. I mean, the kids are coming, no. <laughs> the kids are coming, no. Yeah, I, I don't. So, it's, right. It's not a difficult well, test. Well, we're, we're, we're not, we're, the item before us is, is not. It's not about us. Or it's not about our kids. I think we're doing a pretty good job. I, and, and, I, and I would appreciate it. Okay. That. I appreciate that. Mr. Cohen. Oh. My name is Wayne Cohen. I just wanted to read something here. You know, the politicians of today are really, the people leading our country are the children of the 60s. These were, uh, it's a radical time, uh, a huge socialist movement was taking place during that time. And for whatever reason, and I, I've tried to figure it out, 
many people believe that socialism is really the better form of government than uh, uh, capitalism and, and uh, freedom and so forth. And, and if we look at it, socialism is, or communism or any of that, is the vast majority of everywhere else in the world. There's only a couple of countries, uh, the United States and Israel, I believe, are two totally free, uh, democratic, I don't know if they're a democratic, or not a uh, constitutional republic, or how they operate, but it's a free kind of thing. So in the 60s, a guy named Saul Alinsky, how many people have heard of Saul Alinsky? Okay, so he made up eight rules of how you take over the government and turn us into a socialistic uh, state. And I'll read those rules to you, and you can tell me how many of these so far have taken place. The first one, the government should take over health care. Uh, if you control health care, you control the people. Second, increase poverty. Increase the poverty level as high as possible. Poor people are easier to control and will not fight back if you are not providing everything for them to live. Three, increase debt. Increase debt to an unsustainable level. That way you'll be able to increase taxes and this will produce more poverty. Gun control. Remove the ability to defend themselves from the government. That way you are able to create a police state. Welfare. Take control of every aspect of their lives. Food, housing, income. I'll leave number six for, end, for the end. Number seven. Religion. Remove the belief in God from government and schools. Eight. Class warfare. Divide the people into the wealthy and the poor. This will cause more discontent. It will be easier to take tax from the wealthy with the support of the poor. And where you all fit in is number six. And unfortunately, we have fallen victim to number six. And what the government thinks your role is. And number six, education. Take control. Uh, take control of what people read and listen to. Uh, take control of what people read and listen to us. I don't know what that means. Take control of what children learn in school. So the idea behind this whole conversation is Common Core was a way to continue to teach our children some of those things that lead to what their role is and so forth. And however you define any of this, and I don't really understand much of it, but I will tell you that it is important that we, as a school district, define what our children are going to be taught and how in order to hopefully make them better citizens when it comes to fighting against Saul Alinsky's rules for radicals. Thank you. We have anybody else looking to speak on 6.5? <clears throat> Diane Klosterman. I wasn't going to say anything today, and I think most of the people here have really expressed the true feelings. But what is the law of our land? The Constitution. What governs our, our government? Our United States Constitution. That should be the main thing we focus on for our kids. They should know the difference. What is the difference in our Constitution as opposed to the Constitution of maybe other countries around the world? And why do we have the freedom we have? It's because our forefathers sacrificed everything for us to establish this Constitution. They need to be able to, if, if a foreign idea is brought to them, such as socialism, what are the drawbacks? Why is our form of government the best for our people? Our United States Constitution is the law of our land. If we don't, if they don't, don't have the tools to be able to debate that and discuss that, then we have Sharia law, we can have socialism, we can have everything because the kids can't stand up for what they believe and what this country stands for. Thank you. Anybody else on 6.5? No. <laughs> uh, Mrs. Cohen, if you, were you going to withdraw your motion? Yes. And who seconded it? Okay, thank you. Uh, would somebody like to make a motion or do you want me to do it?
I, I move that we approve 6.5 with uh, changes of dropping the word property out of out of the right section where it says right to life, liberty, uh, property, and the pursuit of happiness, and adding another line there that says the right to the fruits of your labor, yeah. and removing uh, items listed under liberty from the word socialism down and using for liberty, freedom, republic, and democracy, Black's Law is our resource for the definition of those words. Okay. Any discussion? I just want to emphasize. I, I, I see a dead word right there, <laughs> I just want to emphasize the people who just got up and spoke. Um, I, myself, want all of these terms. Uh, I want the kids to learn them. I want them to compare them to our, our, our form of government, our political belief system, our economic system. I mean, but then capitalism's not even mentioned there. Jim, as I won't go there. Uh, but I want capitalism to be mentioned there too. But just it, these these terms need to be in the state standards, or they if not in the school district curriculum. They just don't belong here in in the mission statement, and that's that's all. So that's all I'm trying to say. Anything further, Terry? <clears throat> Nicole Cohen. I'm sorry, I I didn't hear what you removed. What did you remove off the list? I removed everything from the word socialism down. Mm. No. Kathy Cox? Yes. Pat Rhodes? Yes. John Maston? Yes. Item 6.6 .6 is approval of changes to extracurricular, co curricular, immersion activities for tax credit funds. Something happened, Mr. Murray. Mr. President, members of the board, it is recommended that the governing board approve the addition of the Smoke Tree Elementary Homework Club to the tax credit program. Mrs. Hogard, principal of Smoke Tree Elementary School, is requesting the addition of the Smoke Tree Elementary Homework Club to the tax credit program. The purpose of the program is to provide a quiet, safe, supportive environment in which students can receive additional help in all subject areas from highly qualified educators, professionals, and mentors. The program sponsors will be Connie Hogard and Tamara Yates, and upon closure of the program, funds will be transferred to the tax credit on the preference account. I'll entertain a motion on 6.6. .6. I make a motion we approve 6.6 .6 as presented. Second. Yeah. Discussion on 6.6. Change .6. Uh, how it's smoke trees turn. Is that the last? That, do we now have all of them? No. I'm going to do a month at a time, huh? Come on, Roger, we could have done this all the time. So, so the Homework Club is coming. I want to talk with my Siamese council. I want to make sure that we're going to have students that are going to come to the Homework Club. So, yes, I'm planning to visit with you guys in the near future about a nice Homework Club for now. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, any further discussion on 6.6? Pat Rooney? Yes. Kathy Cox? Yes. Nicole Cohen? Yes. John Madison? Yes. Item 6.7 is the approval of Arizona School Board Association policy agreement. Superintendent Seid. Thank you, Mr. Madison. Members of the board, it is recommended that the governing board approve the Arizona School Boards Association policy service agreement subscription not to exceed the sum of $364 per month during the term of this agreement for a total of $17,472. This uh, agreement and approval allows us to partner with ASBA in the development and maintenance of our governing uh, policies and our administrative regulations. This is a four-year agreement. Uh, as you noted in the previous item that had the whole list of technical changes, that is one of the major services that we benefit from is ASBA um, aligning our policy with the constant changes in the, in the law. Okay, I will entertain a motion on 6.7. I'll make a motion for it to approve 6.7. I second. Discussion? 
Perry Mount Church. Kevin Cox? Yes. Nicole Cohen? Yes. Pat Rooney? Yes. John Maston? Yes. Item 6.8 is approval of resolution and borrowing request to Wells Fargo Bank. Mr. Murray. Mr. President, members of the board, it's recommended that the governing board approve and sign a borrowing request to be forwarded to the Mojave County Treasurer along with a resolution authorizing the request. The Mojave County Treasurer has requested the governing board approve and sign a borrowing request to Wells Fargo Bank for a credit line in the amount of $1 million. This request replaces the letter of declaration approved by the governing board in the pa in past years. It is not anticipated the district will be required to borrow funds from Wells Fargo. However, this paperwork must be in place should that become a necessity. It also attaches a resolution um, authorizing the borrowing requests, and both documents have been reviewed and approved by legal. I will entertain a motion on 6.8. I make a motion we approve 6.8 as presented. Second. And Mike, just uh, for clarification, this is done every year, right? Every year. And it's done because of the, uh, the, the fact that uh, uh, tax monies might come in, not come in on time and all that. Correct. And have we ever used it at all? Not that I can see. Okay. Okay. It's, it's just a safety net. Stock cap. Right. You don't want to miss payroll. Okay. We want everyone to know that. We're not going to go borrow a million bucks. <laughs> Well, we do. We know where you live. <laughs> We're not actually spending it, though. We're just putting the insurance policy. Yeah. Uh, I will uh, ask for any further discussion. Perry, then Perry. Nicole Cohen? Yes. Matt Rooney? Yes. Kathy Cox? Yes. John Maston? Yes. Uh, Item 6.9 is the first presentation in review of policy GCCH professional and support staff bereavement leave. It is recommended that the board approve the first presentation of the revised policy GCCH professional support staff bereavement leave. Um, the policy is being updated to reflect current working procedures. All right, I will entertain a motion on 6.9. Make a motion we approve 6.9 as presented. Second. I second. Discussion. I'll make the same comment from the uh, works. Did we just do this? We did, <laughs> but because we just did this, the language had to be tweaked. Okay. What did we change? Um, we, the way that the language currently was, it made it sound like employees got bereavement leave on top of sick leave, but the bereavement leave actually comes from their sick days, so the language was just ironed out. Mm -hmm. Any other discussion, questions? Pat Rooney? Yes. Kathy Cox? Yes. Nicole Cohen? Yes. John Maston? Yes. Item 6.10, approval of contract for contract speed services with the Gore Health Solutions. Mrs. Walter? Mr. President and members of the board, it is recommended that the board approve the contract with Gore Health Solutions for telecare speech services with a speech language pathologist for the 18-19 school year, not to exceed 92,500. The district has not been able to fill a critical full-time speech therapy position. Carter Health Solutions is an approved vendor under the same contract, RFP 17-5201-004. We are requesting approval to contract with Carter Health Solutions for speech therapy services at a rate of $65 per hour for a total sum not to exceed $92,500. The district is obligated to ensure the provision of services for eligible students to receive a free appropriate public education for students requiring related services as required under the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. Funds from the MNO budget will be used to pay for services. This has been reviewed by our purchasing and legal. And I'll entertain a motion on 6.10. Make a motion to be approved 6.10 as presented. I second. Discussion? Uh, this is Walter. Um, how many contracts do we have this year in force with contracting uh, services like this? We're very pleased to share with the public that we've been able to reduce the number of contracted positions to just this one. Okay. Wow. 
were able to hire the two occupational therapists that were previously under contract with the district, so we were able to maintain that continuity, and we've been able to fill the other positions. And that's a pretty significant cost savings to the district by, by doing that. Any other questions on 6.10? Terry? Kathy Hunt? Yes. Nicole Mullen? Yes. Pat Rooney? Yes. John Hansen? Yes. 6.11, approval of voucher student activity funds and auxiliary funds. Mr. Martin. Mr. President, members of the board, it is recommended the board approve the vouchers, uh, district vouchers for July 2018, as well as K-12 student activity funds and K-12 auxiliary funds for June 2018. I'll entertain a motion on 6.11. So moved. Second. Discussion? That new report's really cool <laughs> that we got today. Did everybody get it? I did. Did you I did. get I it? it? Yeah. The visions report that and you that, said? Yes. And that, that actually came right out of the system. Just so like that. It was yeah. one, one time where I didn't have to actually convert it into an Excel spreadsheet. <laughs> what so time did you get it? Did it help your it eyes? It was late, it was like four. Was it really small? Uh, it was, no, it was, actually it was perfect. Good. It came Yay. out. It came out later this afternoon. We we still have some, as mentioned in the email, some things to work out just to make it make it somewhat you know make it optimal for you and the public. So, so everybody's aware as well. Um, these financial reports used to be part of the consent agenda. They're actually now a part of the uh, board package makes them more available to public and discussion to push. Is it a good thing? A little more transparency. So, any questions? Comments? No. Nicole Cohen? Yes. Kathy Cohen? Yes. Pat Rooney? Yes. Pat Maston? Yes. Item number seven is our informational report. Superintendent Messiah. Thank you. I would like to um, again draw attention to the gifts and donations to our district because that is on the consent agenda and we don't have the opportunity to highlight. Um, appreciate very much the Realtors Association pursuing our uh, bucket bin for buckets. So we do have several other donations of buckets as a result of that. We are not going to run out and we believe that we will have an a outstanding bucket bin for a uh, showing. I uh, also appreciate the relics and rods from Lake Havasu City. For, uh, they've been donated $500 to each of our elementary schools. And of course, we have other donations as well. Um, I also uh, appreciate Mrs. Nowakowski mentioning Rachel's Challenge. That is something that we have been very focused on. And we are having our major event on August 31st, which is, or excuse me, August 27th. <laughs> yes. Don't come the 31st. No, no, no. <laughs> August 27th, which is Monday of next week. <laughs> And uh, we will have assemblies at all of our schools, as well as Calvary's Christian. We are including all of our students from Telesis, those who will join us from HPA, and also our homeschool community. And then our community event is <coughs> Monday evening at the Aquatic Center. Dinner will be provided by Lynn's Little China for free for those attending, starting at about 4.30. The event actually begins at 6.15, lasts for one hour. And, um, it's very powerful for those of us who have been through it. It's just incredible how much of, uh, an impact it will have. The, the uh, Rachel's Challenge presentation is um, not appropriate, the version that the adults will see for our elementary age students, because they do actually address the Columbine shooting and the death of Rachel. And so the community um, will be hosting, uh, sponsored by the city and uh, Parks and Rec, a free swim for our elementary age students who come with their parents. For younger than elementary age, uh, they would you just bring them in and sit them on your lap because they're, they're not gonna understand the content anyway. So we do hope that the community will join us and if any of you have any friends or uh, colleagues that you can mention this to, it will be a, a very worth your time that evening to attend. Um, the other, there's uh, two other things I would like to update the board on. First of all, uh, Mrs. Uh, Festa Daigle and I were able to meet with a team at ASU this morning, and this is something that we've been working on for quite some time. The um, ASU Lake Havasu will be starting a teacher credentialing program here in Lake Havasu City, and so at the very 
earliest we would be able to start looking at secondary students teaching in the spring semester of 1819. Um, at the latest, the fall semester in the 1920 school year, we should be able to have elementary and secondary teachers coming out of our ASU campus locally. Um, they were focused on, and we have at our meeting today, the superintendents, uh, actually the assistant superintendent from Parker, although the superintendent has attended other meetings. They went to Kingman, met with the superintendent there, and they also went to the Mojave Valley area and met with the superintendents along the river. And we understand that if we aren't able to identify folks who already want to be in Havasu, they aren't really going to stay with us as teachers. And so this is an ideal opportunity for that. Um, I really do want to compliment Dr. Vandery and his team for putting this together because it would not have happened without him. So we had a team from the Phoenix site here and it was an amazing morning. Uh, also, they did visit. The team visited. We called it a speed dating this morning, 20 minutes at the middle school, at the high school, and at Spoke Tree. And so they had a chance to see at least each of our um, level campuses. And then the final thing that I would like to update the board on, and I did um, make a sheet which I will share publicly as well. This is not a secret, but we have our enrollment history, and we have been talking a lot about um, how declining enrollment is affecting our district. And so we actually opened school this year. We have now uh, dropped those students who were no-shows. And so we have a total um, district-wide right now of 5,417 5, students. We are down from where we started last year. Typically, we start a little higher, but we are actually down 95 students from where we started last year. And this is the first time in a long time that we're down at the elementary level. Um, we are starting lower than we ended last year in uh, two of our schools. And um, as is our trend with the high school, we start higher at the high school, but we lose more kids during the year. So we are seeing uh, a pretty deep decline in our enrollment trend. Uh, right now, we don't have any classes at the elementary, meaning grade level numbers that are over 400. So. So that is a pattern that we're seeing as a district and that is going to influence us. Um, thinking about being down uh, 95 students district-wide, we're talking three or four teachers anyway. So yeah, that's not good news for us. Uh, we are continuing to look at that. Um, uh, I, this is one of the areas where with the ASB supporting the um, not using public funds to fund private education. That's one of the areas that is a detriment to us. And also the competition that we have from our <coughs> schools. So we'll be coming back with some recommendations on how we can reattract some of our students. We know that there are over 400 students attending Calisys and the same at um, HPA. That's a large number of students that we could be bringing back to our schools. Can you tell by grade what's dropped, like second grade to first grade? Yes, yeah, and, and each class coming in is smaller. So right now our smallest class again is kinder. Now some of that is because students kinder and first grade go to other schools within the community. But just generally as a 10, the birth rates, uh, trend, excuse me, birth rates are lower. Uh, in our area is the lowest birth rates within the state of Arizona, Mojave County. Uh, item number eight is our second call of the public. Uh, we had one person fill out the form, and that would be Chris May, if you'd like to come up and talk to us. Hi, Chris May. It's my first time coming to your particular board meeting. Uh, my family and I moved down here uh, almost a year ago, so we come with um, different experiences with the school districts different school districts. One thing that is concerning is the transportation issues. When my I took my daughter to before school uh, where you could go and uh, if there was any changes that needed to be done to the schedule, things like that, you could do that. Talk to your advisor, talk to transportation, things like that at the high school. When I talked to transportation, they said, sorry, we cannot provide transportation. You live outside the district, therefore you need to talk to, give a call to the governor's office. I called the governor's office. They said, you need to talk to the Board of Education. 
I talked to the Board of Education. They said we have nothing to do with transportation. They talked to the school board. With how my work hours are, that puts my daughter. Now there have been buses because I know there are limited buses for the students. There's a bus that goes by where I work. But because we don't live within the district, they will not provide the transportation. So that forces my daughter to walk 2.8 miles by herself if I'm unable to get her due to my work hours. So that's a concern that I would like to see at some point the board address that just because a student doesn't live in Havasu doesn't mean that they don't go to school in Havasu. So if they live a distance that otherwise would be provided by students that live in the area and they get transportation, but a parent works in that area, I would like to possibly see some changes in that area. Another concern that I have is my daughter is part of the journalism class. She's very excited. This is her second year. They have the leadership development that is over in Anaheim really excited the dates were tentatively put out to the families and to the students last May then at the open house we found out oh sorry that's been has to be rescheduled because of the busing and bus driver issues that creates a conflict so it has to revolve around the activity bus for the sports so now you've put something that students that want have an opportunity for a leadership development at odds with those that have sports. I have nothing against sports. I played sports when I was younger. I think it's great. But it shouldn't be sports take a priority over some of the other academic things. Because the things that they're going to be learning, the skills that they're going to be learning that are provided through this program are going to be lasting th for many, many years through their lives. We all learn communications. We all learn academics. We all need a, a rounding off. And that's an opportunity that that provides. And so because there wasn't any transportation and that forced the teachers to go and charter a bus to take these students over because their schedules were not able to be changed because of other commit commitments that they have. That put a burden on the journalism teachers and some of the other teachers that are involved in this. And that just really saddens me because that, luckily there was, every student that applied was able to get a seat on that charter bus. But it shouldn't have been first 40 students that come in are the ones who get a ride and get to go. It should be the, any of them in those particular classes that want to go can go not we have a limited number of seats so I would like to see that addressed as far as this academics versus the sports that everything shouldn't be revolved around sports the third thing I have that I would really like to see and I know will take time in to develop is a running start program where we come from in Washington State, they have a, a running start program. High school students can go to a community college. It's tuition free. They don't have to buy back their credits. They don't have to pay for credits. The textbooks, yes. They would have to help pay for the textbooks and transportation to the community colleges. But they can graduate high school and have a diploma concurrently with having an associate's degree from the college. I've gone to the I've gone and talked to the school about it and they said well you can do AP classes or you can do a dual enrollment but then you have to buy the credits so thank you uh, just just for clarification you said you lived outside the district yes where where do you live Kingman thank you I just would like to give uh, a clarification on a couple of pieces of information. The original trip that was submitted was um, was also limited to 40 students. That's what the advisors limited the trip to. It had nothing to do with transportation. Um, the second item is that the um, the trip is not an academic trip. It's actually a extracurricular activity in relation to the club activity, not to us. 
Item 9 is communication. Uh, do we have any board suggestions for future agenda items? Uh, I, I would like to see the addition personally. Uh, we've had quite a bit of social media on this, and, and all. I would like to see us have a discussion item on our next board agenda on dress code. Yep. Just a discussion item. Your <laughs> and then dress code. I, I would like to definitely have a, a discussion on curriculum. I know I mentioned it, you probably wrote it down, but I'm curious about um, curriculum, um, what we've got in our elementary schools, what we're using. Um, I think I have it all for the high school, or at least I think I do, but now I'm just we do have that last curious. Year, so included as a, as okay. a backup. Anything else? We would like to do our presentation of our easy merit scores at the end, please. Yes, let's do that. <coughs> That's been another hot topic on Facebook. Is it aware of the the Take our items and we'll call you and respond. Okay. Anything else? Um, we have any members of the press or media here? I know that we had a change in our reporters from the newspaper. But Chelsea was going to watch online. Chelsea's watching online. Hi, Chelsea. If you, if you come, we can actually have you ask us questions. So she's online. <laughs> Everybody wait for Chelsea. <laughs> she can type questions. Too. Um, at this, at this point, I will also announce that our next regular meeting is September 18th, 2018, 6 p.m. right here. Uh, there will be a work session uh, just uh, the week prior to that at 4 o'clock on Tuesday the 11th. Uh, and with no further ado, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. I think the motion we adjourn. Second. Sure. That was cool. Kathy Yes. Nicole Cohen? Yes. 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 Thank you. Where are you? <laughs> <laughs>